Well, good morning. As we turn to God's word, will you pray with me this morning? Jesus, we love you. And uh, this morning, Jesus, as we've been singing, we've been focusing our attention and our affections on you. And now, Jesus, uh, we wanna hear from you. We speak to us through words written long ago that are equally applicable today as they were back then. In your name we pray, amen. Well, have you ever been dissatisfied? Have you ever been, oh, don't laugh before I'm preaching, that's not nice. <laughs> have you ever been looking forward to something and then just felt wholly dissatisfied? This summer, my wife, Britton, and I, we were traveling down in the United States. We were in downtown Chicago. We were walking around, and we decided to go to Chick-fil-A. Now, this was the summer before it opened at West Ed. I know there's Chick-fil-A here in town. Please don't come up to me afterwards and tell, believe me, I know. <laughs> what you need to know about me is I love Chick-fil-A. I mean, I was introduced to it back in, in 2011, and every time I have gone to the States oh, since then, I have watched for Chick-fil-A. I have Googled to find where the, clear, the nearest one is, and I make every point of going to Chick-fil-A on those trips. And so we're walking around downtown Chicago, and Britain is looking at all the sites. I'm looking for Chick-fil-A, <laughs> and we spot one. And I love Chick-fil-A because the restaurants are always clean. It's a nice environment. It's quiet. It's a nice family-friendly space. I love it because the service is always exceptional. And I've read stuff about how they train their culture, and I just love to hear all about it. And when you order and you say thank you afterwards, they say, my pleasure. And I love that. And then there's the food, right? Right? And I love my waffle fries and my chicken sandwich, and I just look forward to going to Chick-fil-A. We walk into this Chick-fil-A, and immediately I'm like, this doesn't look like Chick-fil-A to me. The restaurant was dirty, was really busy and noisy. There weren't any, there was dirty tables, dirty floors. I'm like, something's wrong here. I walk up into the line and I get in line and I go to order and I order my food for my wife and me and I say thank you because I'm a good Canadian and they just glare at me. And then they said, next? Okay. So I go over to where you get your food and this was chaos and this was incredibly stressful. I get my food and I think you know where it's going. It wasn't as good as I remember it to be. Have you ever been dissatisfied? Maybe you've been looking forward to going to a certain restaurant and you come away and it's just like, that wasn't as good as I thought it was gonna be. Or maybe you're at work and things just aren't going well and you're not feeling as satisfied as you used to. Or maybe in school you chose this program, you enrolled in this program, you paid good money for this program and now you're thinking, oh, I don't know if I wanna do this. This isn't satisfying anymore after the first six, eight weeks. Or maybe you're in a relationship and it's just like, hmm, this isn't satisfying the way it used to be. I think we've all experienced dissatisfaction at one time or another, haven't we? We've all had that, maybe that's your story now, maybe it's not your story right now, but you can tell about a time when you were dissatisfied. I think we've all experienced dissatisfaction and the reason why I say that because recently in St. Albert Gazette there was an article that talked about the level of satisfaction that we as Canadians are experiencing. Since 2017, Statistics Canada has been keeping track of certain key life measures. And since 2021, the level of satisfaction that we have in these key life measures, like relationships, like finances, like well-being, these key measures have been dropping. So today that 51.8% of Canadians are not satisfied with their life. But it's not just that they aren't satisfied, they actually don't have hope that it's gonna get any better. Because while our satisfaction has been decreasing, our hopelessness in the future has been increasing. Today we're starting a new series. And we're talking about what it means to be fully alive. Because I think we can all relate, uh, relate with what it means to be dissatisfied. Maybe we see ourselves in that Statistic Canada survey. And this series is all about something that Jesus said a long time ago. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said this. He said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Now, when Jesus says these words, he's using a metaphor of a thief and a shepherd. 
And what he's saying is that there are things in life that we think will satisfy us. There are things in life that we think will bring us joy, that will fill our needs, that actually are thieves in disguise. And that these thieves will rob our joy, will rob our hope, will rob our satisfaction from our lives. They'll take it away from us. They don't give it to us, they take it away. But Jesus says that he is the shepherd who looks after his sheep. And instead of stealing from us, he actually gives us hope. He gives us joy. He gives us satisfaction. He gives us fullness of life, he describes it as. Another translation puts it, a rich and satisfying life. Not rich in terms of finances, but rich in meaning, rich in relationship, rich in fulfillment. This is what Jesus promises. And yet, half of us, if Statistics Canada is true, in this room today, everybody over here, or maybe everybody over here, is not satisfied. And so we're gonna talk about what does it mean to have fullness of life? Because Jesus said, we can have fullness of life. And so what does it mean to be fully alive, to have fullness of life? That's what we're gonna talk about in this series. And in doing this, we're gonna look at a book. It's actually a letter, a letter written by someone to people like us who are seeking to understand how to have this fullness of life that Jesus envisions for us. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ephesians. If you don't have your Bible, you can take out your phone or your device. I'm using my iPad and I'm using an app called YouVersion Bible app. You can scan the QR code, it'll take you there. But this letter is written to people like us living in a metropolis, kind of like Edmonton, only it was called Ephesus. And it's written to all of the churches within that city, kind of like us, we are part of a, a group of churches. Only there they were churches that were 30 to 40 people in size, and he's writing to them about it, what it means to be in Christ. You see, here's what you need to know. In order to have fullness of life, in order to be fully alive, you have to be in Christ. What does that mean? Well, to be in Christ is to put your trust in Christ. To believe that he is God. To believe that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, for all the wrong that you have done so that you could have a relationship with him. To be in Christ, to be in Jesus, is to follow Jesus as the leader of your life. But why should we do that? Why, what does this fullness of life look like? This morning I wanna talk about fullness of life and the place where it starts. Ephesians chapter one, beginning at verse three, says this, praise be to God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Some translations, instead of being praise be to God, some translations will put blessed be to God. And the reason why they do that is because the word praise and the word bless or blessing in this verse is the same word in the original language. They're just choosing a different word to translate it as. And I think the author, who's a guy named Paul, he's trying to make a point here. He says, blessed is God who has blessed us with every blessing in the spiritual realms. And that's a lot of blessing going on. A blessing is when good things are poured out on us, when there is favor, it is praising, it is worshiping, it is loving, it is serving. And Paul says that our praise or our blessing of God flows out of a response to what God has done, his blessing us with every spiritual blessing. And in this, this, this verse, we see that our response is to bless, but God has two uses of this word bless. You see, as much as we bless God by worshiping him, he blesses us at least twice as much. And Paul wants us to understand that we bless God, we choose to worship him, we choose to follow him out of a response to what God has done for us. That's what this sentence is saying here. We bless because God has doubly and extremely more blessed us in life. And you see, fullness of life starts with a response. It's a response to what God has done. And he goes on. And here's what we need to understand about this passage, that verse three all the way up to 14 is actually one sentence. 
One sentence, okay? Well, if you look in your Bible, if you look in your YouVersion Bible app, you'll see that there's commas and there's semicolons and there's periods and then there's paragraphs. So it looks like there's all this punctuation that makes it seem like it's not one run-on sentence. But trust me, in the original language, it's one long run-on sentence, one of the longest ones in the New Testament. And Paul has something he wants us to see. And there's a reason he uses one long run-on sentence. He does something special to communicate something incredibly important to us about God. And he uses grammar to do it. Grammar, can you believe that? By using one long run-on sentence, he communicates something incredibly important that serves as the foundation for you and me living fully alive. You see, every sentence, no matter how long it is, has one subject. That's what we need to find out what Paul is talking about. This blessing that God blesses us with that we are to bless him in response to. Well, let's keep reading. He says in verse four, he says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, to love. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So Paul has a point here. And these verses lie at the center of what he wants you and me to understand today. He says, God chose you. God chose you. Have you ever been chosen for something? When's the last time you were chosen for something? You know, oftentimes I think in our memory, if you're anything like me anyways, you remember the times when you weren't chosen, right? Don't we remember those? Like Mr. Lacey's grade eight gym class. Anybody remember gym class? For some of you, that's really recent, I'm sorry. Mr. Lacey's eighth grade gym class, he would have us come into the gym, we would line up on this line, all of us single file, he would choose two people to be the captains. Those captains would then choose the rest of the team. Now, I'm not a jock. I know it's hard to believe when you look at me, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm not fast. I know, again, hard to believe, but it's true. I wasn't very popular. <laughs> Thank you. You know, in the first service, they didn't respond like that. <laughs> and so I was not chose first. I was not chose second. I was not chose third. I would stand on that line for some time. All the time, hoping and praying. Do you, do you know this memory? Yeah. Of not being chosen last, right? And those times when we weren't chosen, like Mr. Lacey's grade eight gym class, tend to stick with us more than the times when we were chosen. And those times when we weren't chosen tend to shape the rest of our life, don't they? Yep. We feel rejected by people. We feel hurt. And we remember the times when we weren't chosen, when we were rejected, when we were unwanted. And they stick with us and they form us. And Paul here begins to say that there is a choice that needs to form your life more than being unchosen. There was one time, I remember in grade eight in Mr. Lacey's gym class where my best friend Jeff actually was the captain. <laughs> and he chose me first chose me first. I remember that feeling and how special it was. Friends, here's what Paul wants you to know. Here's what I want you to know today. You are chosen. You are chosen. You know, Paul says that you were chosen before the creation of the world. I love another translation where it says before the foundations of the earth were formed because ancient Greeks believed that the earth stood up on a foundation and so I just love that kind of idea because a foundation goes in the ground first, right? And so what Paul is saying, he says, you know what, you were chosen before anything was done to create this world. You were chosen. You see, God has a plan and his plan was to create this great big world and everyone in it and before he ever did anything, his plan centered on you, and you are chosen. And to be fully alive is to realize 
that you are chosen. Paul goes on and he uses the word predestined. And, and oftentimes, if you've been around church for a while, Christians argue about what this means. What does predestination and what does predestined mean? And Christians often use this verse incorrectly. They say that this means that God chose some and he didn't choose others. That's actually not what Paul is saying here. What Paul is saying here is actually he chose you before he did everything else. Because that's the context of this verse. Is God for choosing you, predestining you, choosing you before anything else happened in this world. You see, here's what you need to know. Is that for some of us, our mom and dad didn't plan our birth. For some of us, we weren't particularly wanted as children. For some of us, we don't feel particularly wanted right now. Friends, here's the truth, and hear me clearly. Your parents not, may not have chosen you, wanted you. People around you may not appreciate you. But you are chosen by God. Yeah, you are. You are chosen, you were planned before creation was even started. You were chosen. And God is waiting for you to choose him back. To choose to follow him, to choose to receive everything that he has for you, all of the spiritual blessings that he has for you. He, the verse talks about adoption, that you were predestined for adoption as his children. The people in Ephesus where this church was located that Paul is writing to, they knew about adoption. They had two very real images in front of them all the time about adoption. The first was a hill, a hill in Ephesus that everybody knew about, where if you had a child that you didn't want, you took that child to that hill. If you had a child that maybe had some sort of genetic, physical, cognitive, whatever, abnormality, that you would take that child to this hill and you would leave them. And this was legal. And you would leave them and you would walk away. And at night, other people would come to that hill and they would adopt that child. They would adopt that child into slavery. If the child was old enough to go immediately into slavery, that child would go into slavery. If it wasn't, they would adopt that child, raise it up, and then take it and sell it into slavery. And that was an image that everybody in Ephesus had, that the broken are unwanted, and you get rid of them, and they are adopted into slavery. But there's another image that they had as well. The memory and the story of a man named Julius who adopted a young boy named Augustus. Now, Augustus didn't need to be adopted. He actually came from a wealthy family. And yet, Julius saw something in Augustus and chose to adopt him. And when Julius died, all of everything that Julius had became Augustus's. And Augustus went on to become arguably the greatest Roman Empire, the greatest Caesar of Roman Empire. He was Augustus Caesar. And Julius Caesar adopted him. And that was a story that was told over and over and over again of how an emperor adopted a child. And so the people in Ephesus, they have a clean understanding of what it is. You see, adoption is not being bought and sold into slavery. It's not about being unwanted. Adoption is about being deeply wanted. About God seeing you and choosing you before you ever did anything to earn it. God chose you. And he did it because it gave him great pleasure. See, you are chosen. And to be fully alive is to realize that you are chosen. That you are not unwanted. You know, oftentimes we can feel unwanted. Maybe for some of us here, we were adopted and, and the memory of being adopted begins by feeling unwanted. Friends, here's what I want you to know. All of us are adopted, and all of us are chosen. And your birth parents may not have wanted you, but God always did. And God adopts you. He chooses you before anything else. What does he choose you to, is the question. 
Well, the next verse talks about it. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance to the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Three things in here. Redemption, forgiveness, his grace that he lavishes on us. You see, we have wounds that have shaped us and formed us and made us who we are. I have them, you have them. Some of them were done to us and some of them were done by us. Choices that we make that now we think define the essence of who we are. Some of them were done to us and we think that's who we are because why would someone else hurt us like that if we weren't worthy or deserving of what they did to us and neither of those things are true. And God knows this. And he lavishes on us redemption. Redemption is when you take something broken and you make it whole again. It is when God takes the things that we've done and the things done to us and he makes us whole again. He forgives us. He makes us new. And to be chosen is to realize the newness of life that we have in Christ, who redeems us and forgives us and lavishes it his grace on us. What is grace? Grace is the unmerited favor of God. It is not deserving something and unable to do anything to earn it and yet receiving it. And this is what God does, that he lavishes this upon us. And why does he do this? Because it gives him good pleasure. It gives him great pleasure. I think sometimes we don't realize how much pleasure we give to God. That he chooses you not because he has to. And he chooses you not because you are worthy of it. He chooses you because he wants to. Because he finds delight in who you are. And he did this knowing the life that you would live knowing the things that you would do. And he chose you, and it gives him great joy. Isn't that amazing? Not just a little bit of joy. I think sometimes we struggle with this idea that we give God pleasure. I think we have this idea of God that, you know, it comes from John 3.16, and this was my story in life for a long time, is that I believe that God loved me in John 3.16, so it's God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Right? And we identify because we're part of the world, right? And so we say, yeah, God loves me, but I'm not sure he likes me. Anybody ever feel like that? God loves me, but I don't know that he likes me. That he takes joy in me. I suffered with this for a long time. I didn't think God liked me. I knew he loved me. I had degrees that told me that. But did he like me? I don't know. Friends, God doesn't just love you. He likes you, and he likes to be around you, and he wants to spend eternity with you, and he wants to be with you. You bring him great pleasure. When I think about this, when I think about how much pleasure just me existing, me going about my day-to-day -day life, how God loves to just watch that, you know what comes to mind? It's a memory that I have. It's a memory that includes my wife and my son, a memory from when my son was growing up and he was into sports. And my son played baseball. Okay, I, I, I confessed to you earlier that I, I'm not a jock and I'm not that fast. My son's not far from the tree, right? Like he, <laughs> he's good looking <laughs> and he's smart. So he's got stuff going for him, but he's, he's not the greatest jock. But my son loved baseball because his mom loved baseball and, and his grandpa loved baseball. I went to baseball because I love my son. And I remember in those days when my son was playing baseball, we would watch there, we'd sit behind the home plate watching him play, and I remember this one game. This one game comes to mind whenever I think of the pleasure that God has in you and in me. This one game comes to mind. We were sitting in the bleachers behind the home plate, and it was near the end of the game, and, and my son wasn't doing that well, and his team, they had tied the score, but we were down still. And my son was probably gonna be the last at bat. That's what I thought anyways, because we were two away and this is the last one. 
And my son steps up the bat and he begins to swim, right? He gets ready to do this and he swings and misses. Strike one. Way to go, son. You can do it. That's my response. This is my wife. Come on, Liam. You can do it. He steps up again and he swings again. Miss. Strike two. My wife is still clapping and cheering. I'm thinking, I wonder if we can stop at McDonald's on the way home. (laughs) My wife is cheering for him. And he steps up to bat again. The pitcher's looking really confident. He swings and he clips the bottom of the ball. And there's just enough forward momentum that the ball goes forward, not back, just in front of the plate so it's in play. And my son is standing there and my wife says, run, Liam, run! (laughs) And my son is very obedient. (laughs) So he runs with everything that's in him. Did I tell you he's not that fast? (laughs) And he gets to first base. And my wife is up on her feet, cheering away for him. And my son is feeling kind of cocky. And he starts to lead off. And the pitcher's like, I'm gonna get this guy. And he throws and the first base guy misses. And my wife goes, run, Liam, run! (laughs) And he gets to second. Well, now Liam is like really feeling cocky and he's, he's really leading off. And he steals third. And he's on third base. And my wife's going, come on, Liam, you can do this, you can do this. I'm sitting there, that's our son. Because everybody's looking at her, because she's cheering so loud. And he steals home. And we win the game. When I think of the pleasure that God has in you and me, I think of that memory. And God delights in you. And he is standing on his feet and clapping his hands in delight for you. Because it gives him great pleasure. You see, being fully alive is about realizing you're chosen. And being fully alive is about realizing you are a chosen and loved child of God and beginning to act based on that. Acting based on being a chosen and beloved child of God. I had a friend a number of years ago challenge me with this question. It's a question that I've sought to bring into my life on a regular basis. The the question is, how would a deeply loved child of God respond? I was going through some stuff a number of years ago and he said to me, Kirk, I want you to think about this and I want you to choose to respond differently. This is what Paul is saying here. You are blessed with every blessing in the spiritual realm. You are chosen, you are adopted. God takes great pleasure in you and now you get to choose how you respond. How would a deeply loved child of God respond in this situation? We don't always get it right. In fact, we won't get it right. I don't get it right. And there were moments, even this past week, where I didn't get it right. But we start again. And we begin to live out of the reality that God has blessed us with every blessing in the spiritual realms. He chose us as his sons and daughters to be adopted because he loves us and it brings him great joy. And to be fully alive is to live in the identity of this. It is to live realizing this is who you are, not what others have said about you. And when you choose to live out of your chosenness, you can steal home base. You can run. Tell me, are you living out of that? How would a deeply loved child of God respond to what's going on in your life? We need to begin to embrace that. You know, Paul, he he gives us this first chapter and I think his thought is that 
Now, in light of everything that I've just said, you need to make better choices because if you would just choose to live on this identity, then it would change everything else in your life. It reminds me of something from my teenage years. In my teenage years, there was a company that began to have all these commercials. Uh, these commercials had people come up and they'd say, hey, would you like to take a drink of this? Just two sips of this drink. They believed that if you would drink their product, that it would change the way that you think, that it would change the choices that you make in your life. And this is what became the Pepsi Taste Challenge. And Pepsi believed that if you would just, if they could get a Coke drinker just to drink their Pepsi, just two sips of it, that it would change their life and they would begin to choose a different cola for the rest of their life. And so they would have somebody drink it and then they would unveil, oh, you chose Pepsi. And the idea was that this taste test would shape every other choice that you make in your life. And I think Ephesians 1 is Paul's taste test for us. That if we would taste and see who God is, taste and see what God says about us, that we would choose differently from this point on. And so as we think about how do we respond to this this week, I think we need to take the challenge. Not the Pepsi challenge, but this challenge of living as chosen people and choosing to respond differently this week. So here's what I invite you to do with me this week. For the next seven days, this is gonna be our chosen challenge. Choose to wake up in the morning and think about your day and ask this question, how would a deeply loved child of God respond to the things that you have on the agenda? As you go through your day, begin to ask this question, how would a deeply loved child of God respond in this situation? And sometimes you're gonna get it right, sometimes you're gonna fail. This week I had this bout of anxiety, I struggle with anxiety. And I was standing in front of the mirror and I, this anxiety was just welling up within me and I, I, I remembered this question. And I said, how would a deeply loved child of God respond in this situation? And all of a sudden this peace just came over me. And the anxiety that I had felt went away. And so this week, you'll get it wrong, you'll get it right. But keep choosing to live as a child of God. Keep choosing to live in this identity that is yours. It's yours. It's yours. You gotta choose it though. God's done his part long time ago. He chose. Now you gotta choose. Take the challenge. If you wanna learn more, I'm gonna talk about identity this week, Tuesday. I'm doing something called Soul Care. And it's Tuesday nights at the Hub. It started last week. It's not too late to sign up. And on Tuesday night, I'm gonna be talking about this identity of who we are in Christ. And the lies that kind of steal that from us. And so you can come Tuesday night, 7 o'clock at the Hub, be a part of Soul Care, learn about your identity, who you are in Christ. Maybe that's not for you, maybe that's, you can't commit to that sort of thing, but then just come next week having lived out this challenge and choosing to live as a holy, loved, and chosen child of God. Because that's who you are. Now here's some good news for you. You don't have to do this alone. I mean, there's everybody in this room that can walk with you and you can hold each other kind of accountable for this and say, hey, how'd you do it living out as a child of God today? And they may say, oh, I blew it. And they say, so did I. Let's try again harder tomorrow. But here's the thing, as you blow it, encourage each other and say, you know what? There's someone else that wants to help us in this. Paul talks about them at the end of this passage. He says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth and the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. See, here's the promise that's here, is that as you choose to live in your new identity as chosen, beloved child of God, you are not alone in this. That God has given you his spirit. God is living within you from the moment when you first believed in Jesus. And he wants to help you live in your new identity. He wants to help you choose to be chosen. And the Holy Spirit will help you. Live out the fullness of your inheritance. What is your inheritance? Forgiveness, redemption, grace, healing, hope, fullness of life. Holy Spirit will help you live out your inheritance of being fully alive. So this week, choose 
to take the challenge and choose to respond to all that life throws at you by saying, how would a deeply loved child of God respond in this situation? And then choosing to respond like that child. Because that's who you are. And that's how you live a life that's fully alive. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. And this week as we seek to live out this identity that you've given us, will you help us to live as chosen? You chose us, now we need to do the choosing back. And may we live with this question and may we wrestle with it and may, we, may it take root within our soul, reshaping the things that are broken, the wounds that are there, and may it change who we are. In your name we pray, amen.